morning to all of you and thank you very much for coming by. I will make a few uh, introductory comments and then I'll ask my colleagues also to chip in. Um, in terms of the overall performance of the economy, um, the headline message that I'd like to give is that we are trying to put in place the building blocks for having strong macroeconomic fundamentals and a, sus a growth framework which is going to give us sustained growth over 10-15 years. So those are the two overall objectives. Um, I'll, before I get to what we are doing to achieve that, uh, let me say a little bit about uh, you know the, the real economy and, and the performance uh, of key macro indicators. As you know, growth was 4.4% last year. Um, the drought affected agricultural performance significantly. We had negative, four, again, about 4.2% growth, I, I believe. Um, and uh, we also had fairly uh, significant fiscal consolidation. Uh, the budget deficit came down by about 1% of GDP, which clearly had a, a compressing effect on the economy, but that was intended. I mean, you know, to create the, 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 the strong building blocks that I was uh, talking about, clearly fiscal consolidation is, is critical. Uh, so that was necessary, but when one goes through that stabilization process, uh, the growth does get uh, affected. Uh, but what we're doing is putting in place, as I said, a framework for sustained growth. We want to get away from this past practice of creating artificial uh, sugar highs in terms of the growth process by uh, having misaligned macroeconomic policies. Um, the, uh, so that's on the, on the growth side. On the inflation side, we've seen the um, numbers, uh, the headline numbers in particular, um, going beyond our target of 4 to 6 percent. But that we see as being temporary. It is not due to underlying demand pressures in the economy. Uh, we don't really see very much of that at all. The inf inflation peak that we are seeing, or that we have seen, I think we're beginning to see it come down already, but what we saw over the last month or two was due to one, the base effects of extremely low inflation in the first quarter of 2016. We imported deflation because glo commodity prices globally were extremely low. If you remember, oil prices came down to $28, I think, per barrel in February of last year. So we had a very strong base effects because of ex there was extremely low inflation uh, in the first quarter of 2016 because of the deflation that we imported uh, through uh, international prices. Then the... the um, uh, uh, second factor, of course, was the, the VAT adjustment. Uh, a third factor was the supply disruption due to the drought. And the fourth factor uh, was some depreciation of the currency. Now, none of those things are sensitive to the interest rates. You know, you can't uh, really uh, address those issues through the, 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 the interest rates. So, uh, uh, this is why we have been cautious in terms of increasing interest rates. Um, the Monetary Board took the decision to increase interest rates by 25 basis points, mainly as a signaling device. Because once the headline inflation rate gets to 7.9%, um, then you can begin to get uh, wage pressure, etc., which leads to demand side uh, inflationary pressure. So we wanted to knock that on the head very early. Uh, by signaling that the uh, monetary board was committed to ensuring that inflation remained within the within, remained within the uh, uh, targeted band, uh, so that was a kind of preemptive move to anchor inflationary expectations. Um, then, on the balance of payment side, uh, the the uh, current account deficit um, worsened from 2.3 to 2.4 percent. But if you look at that. It's almost entirely due to the effects of the drought, uh, because um, the main uh, reason for the for the uh, the deterioration uh, or the or the 
the, the, the outcome being a little bit above our target was the the oil, the oil uh, basically oil imports because of largely the price also went up a little bit but more than that uh, it was the reliance on thermal generation because of the uh, impact on hydropower generation as a result of the uh, drought and the other fact is we also imported a little bit more food uh, because of the drought uh, so we see the balance of current account balance of the balance payment coming down to about 2.1 percent of GDP by the end of the year then the final thing is the reserves um, there was a, a fairly sharp outflow of capital from the government securities market uh, after the uh, US elections the last couple of months of last year and the first couple of months of this year uh, this was one institutional investor basically unwinding his position in Sri Lanka and this was again part of the trend money flowed out of uh, emerging markets and frontier markets uh, during that period and we were affected by that as well uh, but now we are beginning to see a reserve build up uh, you had we had the uh, international sovereign bond issuance of 1.5 billion uh, week before last uh, a syndicated loan of 450 million is expected to come in in the next couple of weeks uh, the uh, um, the central bank itself will be purchasing about 1.2 billion dollars from the market that's our target we think we, we can do that uh, plus uh, we, we, we uh, the government plans to divest some assets and could realize somewhere between 300 and 500 million uh, through that uh, and the Hamman Thota deal my understanding still is that it's likely to go ahead but it may take a month or two uh, and if I don't know what the final deal is but if it's broadly the same as what we have heard then about 400 million of that money could come in this year. One mi 100 million on signature and 300 million after the uh, after three months. And the remainder of the money will come in next year. Uh, so that's on the reserve side. Um, we, there are also some other uh, possibilities of, uh, of uh, government being able to borrow. There are things being negotiated. So all in all, we reckon reserves to be about seven point. So we are projecting seven point two billion uh, by the end of the year. Uh, I should have said inflation. We are, um, you know, our uh, models are showing that it will come down to about five percent by the end of the year, the middle of our target. Uh, so that's uh, a quick kind of thumbnail sketch. Okay, what are we doing in terms of strengthening the macroeconomic fundamentals? One, we are putting in place three frameworks for the key macroeconomic policy instruments. The fiscal adjustment, uh, which sees the uh, budget deficit coming down to 3.5% of GDP, is embedded uh, in the uh, IMF's EFF agreement. Uh, the central bank is moving towards flexible inflation, uh, uh, towards a flexible inflation targeting regime. Uh, which will enable us to be much more proactive uh, in terms of monetary policy formulation. And we are also putting in place a framework for managing the exchange rate, whereby very gradually we will bring the, uh, the rear index down to 100 and then manage the nominal interest rate uh, to keep the rear index at 100, which should enable us to maintain the competitiveness of the economy or to support the competitiveness of the economy so there are these three clear frameworks and I think if we are able to uh, pursue that there's still all all these are work in progress but we I think we are making progress and if they come into place we should be able to have more predictable uh, and consistent macroeconomic policies which give us sound macroeconomic fundamentals what is being done to strengthen the growth framework there as you know, the government is doing quite a lot of work on the investment climate. Uh, they've got these 10 task forces uh, which have been constituted on each of the 10 pillars of the World Bank's Doing Business Index. The idea is to see whether there can be deregulation, infusion of technology, etc., to, uh, um, uh, to improve uh, the investment climate. Uh, then on investment promotion, uh, Ricardo Hausmann's team has been working with the BOI and there what they're trying to do is f 
focus to identify sectors where we can move quickly and smoothly with our current endowment in terms of human physical resources and know-how. Hausman has this theory about how monkeys go uh, across the jungle to get to the top of the trees. So they jump from one tree to the other at a higher branch and you keep going. So that, in terms of exports, the idea is about improving complexity. So you go from your current export basket to a somewhat more com complex export basket. And so what you have to do is to identify the branch you can jump onto next, which is a little bit more complex. And they have worked with the BOI to identify some of these sectors. And within those sectors to identify key anchor investors. For instance, in Vietnam, Samsung accounted for 40% of their exports at one time, earlier on in the process. In Costa Rica, Intel accounted for something like 70 or 75% of their uh, uh, exports. So that the, the, I mean, the message uh, to draw from that, the lesson to draw from that is, if you can get three, four anchor investors in uh, sectors where you have significant potential, it can be transformative. So this is, this is uh, the BOI is moving towards a much more focused approach uh, of this nature. Um, then in terms of trade facilitation, uh, there is, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the electronic single window in the customs, they are moving towards operationalizing that effectively. And I think uh, kind of a one-stop shop in the central clearance unit, these are things they're working on for trade facilitation. But really, arguably, the kind of jewel in the crown, if it works well, are the trade, that uh, the, it's trade policy. So under trade policy, there are a number of things going on. One is the government, I think, has already, if I'm not mistaken, put a bill into parliament for the anti-dumping bill. If it's not in parliament, it's close to going to parliament, the anti-dumping bill. Two, they are uh, formulating a national trade policy framework which will set out uh, uh, the, the overall trade policy framework. Three is they are uh, um, uh, going to, as I said, we are going to try to have a more competitive exchange rate which will help exports. Four is to uh, um, uh, have a trade policy adjustment package. Uh, the idea there is to strengthen local um, enterprises to become more competitive. Because as you sign trade agreements, some of the sectors would clearly need to be opened up. And the idea is to give local enterprises support to become more competitive and for workers to retrain. So those are two components that are usually associated with these trade adjustment uh, packages, programs. Um, but the big story, of course, are these trade agreements. Um, let me first say uh, some principles, uh, talk about some principles. When one is uh, uh, negotiating with much larger uh, countries, trading partners, you have to have the uh, principle of non-reciprocity uh, built into the agreement. Uh, and special and differential treatment. Now, both China and India accept that. I mean, clearly our economy is very asymmetrical in relation to those economies, and the trade agreements will always be based on that. What does that mean? It would mean that, for instance, we would, uh, our negative list would be much longer than theirs. In the case of services, our positive list would be much shorter than theirs. In terms of the phasing in program, for instance, we may have seven or ten years uh, to liberalize a particular sector, where may, whereas they may do it in three or five years. So these are the ways in which you have, um, uh, you tackle non-reciprocity. You can also build in safeguards against import surges, and the dispute resolution mechanism has to be right. So these are all things that our trade negotiators know very well. and. Um, the important thing is to negotiate good agreements. But what is the benefit of these trade agreements? For me, um, if we are able to deepen the current FTA in goods with India and then widen the agreement to cover uh, uh, investments, uh, sorry, services, investment, training, um, and technology, and have a similar agreement with China and Singapore, then if you take if, say this happens within the next 12 months, I think the government is trying to do it by the end of the year, but let's say it happens in the next 12 months, and you take the restoration of GSP plus as well, 
Sri Lanka would have preferential access to a market of 3 billion people. So that is China, India, Pakistan, Europe, Singapore. Uh, I don't know. I think the Singaporeans have access to both China and India on a preferential basis. I don't know of any, uh, but they don't, I, I don't think they have a GSP plus for sure, right? I'm yeah, sure they yeah. don't, yeah. So I don't know of any other country which has preferential access to these three large markets. So that is our USP. Then you have to take that side by side with the fact that we are right in the middle of China's maritime silk route. We are 20 miles from the fastest growing large economy in the world. And the Indian Ocean geopolitics is playing out in a way that we can leverage our strategic location in a way that we have never been able to do before. I, the story is really we need, we need to be able to capitalize on the relationships we have with all the big players uh, who are interested in the Indian Ocean to get the best possible deal for ourselves. So that, that I think this is where, I, so the, the, the trade agreements are not only about getting access to markets, which is important, because we're trying to get access for our exporters, which is critical. But on top of that, the, the real prize is to leverage the trade investment nexus, to show this preferential access to a market of 3 billion people, to show the strategic location of the country as a hub for this region, and also being equidistant between the East and the West, and being on these major shipping uh, uh, shipping uh, routes, all that, to bring all that together to attract FDI to, because <coughs> unless we attract FDI and transform our export performance, it will be very difficult for us to, to address the challenging debt dynamics that the country has. I didn't talk about the debt dynamics in the, in, at the beginning, not because I wanted to avoid it, because I forgot, but, but I am happy to talk about it uh, you know, in, in the Q&A. Um, uh, uh, the the um, so that's the trade policy story. Uh, so all these things really should enable us, the improvement in the in investment climate, the more targeted investment promotion, um, trade facilitation which reduces transaction costs uh, uh, in, the, in the tradable sector, and uh, 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 trade policy which can give us preferential access to a market of 3 billion people. Uh, go side by side with our location and, and excellent international relations. That also has to come in. Um, so when you take all that together, there's a real opportunity. So what are some of the key programs the government is introducing? And as you know, um, the, the government has spoken about two economic corridors. The Prime Minister has spoken about two economic corridors. One from Kandy through to Hamantota. So you have the Japanese producing a master plan for Kandy development, which is going to be sort of culturally, religiously uh, sensitive and have an industrial zone. Then around uh, Kuliapitiya Kurunagala, there is, uh, I understand, interest from the Koreans and the Andhra Pradesh uh, uh, investment cooperation, development cooperation. Then you have the Western Region Megapolis plan, which I think all of you know about. I don't need to go into details. And the uh, International Financial Center Port City Project. Then you go south, you go to Hamantota and the development there. And then uh, on the Hamantota, before I go to Trincomalee, let me say this. In my own take on the Hamantota port deal uh, is one, we should negotiate the best possible deal. That's taken for granted. But it is wrong to look at the deal on its own, the port deal on its own, because the port can serve as a catalyst for much more. You know, we've been independent for now, what, 79, over 69 years. We have done very little for the people of Monoragala. We have done very little for the people of Uva. People of Hamandura have some assets, but at the moment, that's not working for them. So this port deal has the potential to catalyze development of an area which, which we have let down very badly. We have not done much. No government, very few, nobody has been able to do. I mean, there are resource constraints, water constraints, all kinds of reasons. But if there is a real opportunity to transform that region and the port deal is a catalyst for that development, 
then I think we should look at it in that light. Not just look at the port deal on its own. But having said that, I'm not saying that you give, give everything away on the port deal. We should negotiate as rigorously as possible, but not see this just as a port deal. This is a deal which could transform an area of the country which we have let down for 769 years. Okay, then the other thing is, of course, Trincomalee, where uh, uh, Japan, India, and Singapore are working together to do a master plan. Uh, now, you see, the, the idea, as I said, about the Hamantota development is to provide benefits for Hamantota, uh, um, Monragula, Uva, etc. The Trincomalee development is expected to sweep across to the Rajarata as well. So, and, and, and the roads are being, I, I've forgotten to mention, of course, there are these highways that are being built. The Colombo can, Candy, I think Colombo, uh, uh, is it Kegol or Kegol, right? Colombo, Kegol, there is a highway. And there are these, Kurunagala, Kurunagala. And the highways also connect, connectivity in the north, you know, from Manatru to Trincomalee, etc. So, the idea is to allow this Trincomalee development to bring benefits for the whole Rajarata as well through improved connectivity there as well. So those are some of the big projects. So to summarize, hopefully we are putting in place frameworks to improve the macroeconomic fundamentals. Um, there is um, a growth, uh, 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 you know, the investment climate, investment promotion, trade policy, trade facilitation in terms of strengthening the growth framework and uh, these major projects. Now, I missed one thing out and that is that we need to have a new growth model. I, I saw the Prime Minister yesterday had spoken about exports. Uh, I think that's crucial. I think arguably the biggest, uh, I need to choose my words carefully, the, 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 the criticism that could le one could level against the policies of the past is that the tradable goods sector came down from 75-80% of GDP to 45% of GDP. You know, if to have had a policy framework that allowed that is really, uh, in my view, unconscionable. You know, because for a small country with our endowment, to allow that to happen is, is serious. I mean, that, that, you know, that has set us back big time. And some of these debt dynamics and all the problems we are having is the fact that we had a policy framework that shifted us in that direction. Because that's wholly inappropriate for a country like ours. So what we need to do is now change that and to get the tradable goods sector up and it really exports. And in the modern world, you know, the, the, the distinction between exports and imports tends to get blurred because the most dynamic component of the international trading system are the regional and global supply chains. And for that, you need to be able to import and then, you know, push it out quickly. So uh, that's, so we have to really get the trading environment uh, up. Now, a, a World Bank study, the, the country's systematic diagnostic, which they did a couple of years ago, said that the economy was as close as it was in 1970, mainly because of paratariffs. Now, I think the government is committed to reducing paratariffs over the medium term. Clearly, you can't do it as suddenly, partly because of revenue, partly because you have to give domestic capacity a chance to uh, make themselves more competitive and you have to have time to do that.